Um, so we now have uh, three online uh, presentations to look forward to. And um, the first one is from um, Patrick uh, Bismans. I hope I'm pronouncing your surname right. <laughs> um, okay, uh, over to you, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you can see my slides. I think I see them in the back, so it should be fine. Um, you pronounce my name more or less correct, so uh, I've, I've heard much worse as Beismans, but it doesn't really matter. Um, yes, my name is Patrick Beismans. I'm an Associate Dean for Education at Maastricht University, also Associate Professor in Teaching and Learning European Studies, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, thank you very much um, for making it possible for people from other universities to join this really very interesting conference. Um, I've been attending the whole thing so far and I've noticed that some of the topics that you are discussing today and are discussing at your universities are very much the same topics that we're discussing here. Think of things like student transition, student engagement, uh, attendance, I've also heard internationalization as a um, issue at the moment. You may have in fact have read in The Guardian a few days ago that in the Netherlands we have a discussion about this too. Um, the article in The Guardian was a little bit more negative about what may happen um, than well, hopefully reality will be like because at Maastricht University where I'm based and also my colleague Rachna, it's very funny that we're actually in the same panel, um, is the most international university in the Netherlands with over 60% of students come, uh, not being Dutch. Um, but I'm not going to talk too much about this today. I'm going to talk about a topic that links some of these issues together, um, the student journey as such, but in particular, a specific issue related to the student journey in Maastricht and in most Dutch universities, and that's called the binding study advice. I'll explain to you shortly um, what that actually entails. Um, but I'll first say a few words about undergraduate programs in Dutch higher education, where there are quite some differences uh, compared to the UK situation. But I'll tell you a little bit more about the undergraduate programs that we have at Maastricht University's Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, where I'm based. And then I will be talking a little bit about this binding study advice, and in particular why this is being questioned, even though it's seen as a uh, fundamental part of the student journey in Dutch higher education. And then I'll refer a little bit to the discussions that we're having at uh, the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, which are very early discussions, uh, but I'm very much looking forward to any questions or comments that you may be having. Um, so let me start by saying a few words about uh, undergraduate education in uh, the Netherlands. Um, we have uh, 14 universities in the Netherlands, which offer a total, this academic year, of 422 different bachelor degrees, undergraduate degrees. Most of these degrees, and when I say most, it's really the vast majority of these degrees, do not select. Every student, and that is every student from uh, the EU or the European uh, Economic Area, has access to Dutch higher education as long as they have the right diploma. There's no selection. You cannot be held at the gate uh, for some reason or another. As long as you live up to these requirements, you will have a place in uh, Dutch higher education. Of those 422 uh, programs, I think about 50 to 60 actually to any form of selection, which could be based on trying to find the right students. It will also be based on just having a limited number of places available for students. Um, the average student in the Netherlands also pays, uh, pays a lot less money than the average student in the UK. If you are from an EU country or an EEA country, you pay just over 2,000 2, uh, euros uh, of fees. That's the fees for next year. So that means that for a lot of uh, programs, it's very important that you get the right student into your program. I do write in inverted commas because it's very difficult to determine what makes someone a right student or not. And that's one tool which in particular is being used to do so, and that's called the binding study advice. It's a strange word, binding advice. Yeah, there's a bit of a weird uh, uh, a translation to English uh, because it is actually binding um, in many ways. But what does that entail? Each student 
um, that is in one of those uh, programs needs to obtain a minimum number of credits out of the total of 60 that you can gain in your first year. Only then will you be able to continue your studies. And as I said, this is applied by most programs in the Netherlands that do not select. Selective programs don't have this for obvious reasons. Uh, and it's very much seen as a way in which to ensure that students make sufficient progress. One of the reasons for this is that um, Dutch higher education, the way it's financed, is very much based on the total number of students that you have, but also very much so uh, the amount of students and the number of students that graduate. Um, and this is a set for a date of four years in total. So it's very important for universities to have this, or at least they think it's very important to have this, because it gives them some control of who's remaining in the program and some opportunity to sift out students who are underperforming. As I said, it's out of 60 credits and most programs will have about 45 out of 60. If you have less than those 45 credits, you get what is called a negative binding study advice, which then means that you're no longer able to continue your studies. Um, at the faculty where I'm based, I'm also Ragnar's based, um, this is more or less the same. So our students have similar tuition fees um, and our students also need to um, have a, a certain number of credits before they start, uh, before they can continue into their second years. Um, all programs in Maastricht, it's worth saying, uh, are based on problem-based learning. So earlier in the panel debate, there was a discussion about also the importance of small group learning. And that's very much a core of what we do in Maastricht, problem-based learning. Well, most of the learning revolves around small groups of 12 to 15 students. Uh, at our faculty, we have a total of three BA programs, one in arts and culture, one in digital society, one in European studies. Arts and culture attracts 100 new students a year. The same goes for digital society, whereas European studies is about 300 new students each academic year. Um, so we're talking about 500 new uh, BA students each year. Uh, on top of that, we have a number of master programs and in total we have about 1800 students at our faculty. Uh, but those three programs, uh, they employ uh, binding study advice and the threshold that we employ at the moment is 42 out of 60 credits. Uh, that's slightly less than the average in the Netherlands, but it partly also has to do with the modular system that we apply in Maastricht. And this basically means that students can miss out on the credits for two larger courses without immediately being told that they have to leave uh, uni. I should stress, obviously, students who encounter certain specific circumstances can apply for a hardship so that they can continue. Uh, but in principle, as a 42 out of 60 credits threshold that students need to live up to. We do have all kinds of measures in place to help them. We have student advisors who are extremely active. We also have a mentor program that we've had for uh, 10 or 11 years now, uh, where members of academic staff have a small group of students uh, that they meet every so many times each year. As one exception to all of this at our faculty, and I won't talk too much about it, but we also have a BA Global Studies, or it's actually BSC, BSC, so Bachelor of Science, uh, where we are the host faculty, but it's actually a university program which is offered by all the faculties together. And they do select and they also have higher tuition fees. Now, as I said, this binding study advice is a key component for Dutch University to, to steer a little bit um, how students progress in their program and how students journey through the program. Again, there are other things like mentor programs, but universities see this as a key component in terms of ensuring that students do well and ensuring that they progress well and that they graduate within four years. But two things have led to questions about uh, binding study advice. Um, the first one is COVID. Um, because of the situation of COVID, uh, it was decided that many universities also at ours and also in our faculty, that we didn't employ the negative binding study advice anymore to ensure that students, due to all kinds of reasons with COVID, they were at home, especially your international students were struggling because they also couldn't go to the library and so on and so forth, to allow them um, some more flexibility. So there was no negative advice anymore. The only thing that students with less than 42 credits had to do is to go to a mandatory meeting with our student advisor to make a study plan to ensure that they would catch up again. 
Now, the interesting thing is that this created a um, sort of natural experiment because we found out two things when looking at some of the data. Um, one is that students with very few credits, they don't need a binding study advice to stop. And the other thing is that some of that data suggested that some of the students who had, let's say, between 30 and 41 credits still did actually quite well by the end of their second year, even though in a normal circumstance, they would have been sent away. Now, this data is still not conclusive. We're looking for further data, but it does raise the question on whether the binding study advice actually does what it is intended to do, namely push students to study and select those that are able to do and continue their studies and complete their studies within those four years. The other thing which has um, led to questions about the binding study advice is a, is a longer discussion that's been going on quite a bit and which has been fueled by the student organizations in the Netherlands. That's one about anxiety and stress. Having to meet those uh, credits can and is often perceived as being stressful. So the Minister for Education recently put forward a letter with some new ideas about how to deal with this. He also said that student universities use the BSA more to select students, even though it's not really selection. And that through this, they actually cause further stress and that we should step away from this. So there's now a new proposal that all the uh, thresholds should be lowered to 30 credits. That raises a lot of questions because is that enough? We now already have students who obtain 43 credits and phone their parents and say, I've passed the first year, but obviously they have quite a large substantial study delay. So this has led to all kinds of questions. Um, and in particular at our faculty, we're trying to see what we can do in these new circumstances. Should we maybe abolish the binding study advice? Should we approach it in a different way? And what else can we do? I just want to give you a few examples to give you a sense of the discussion that we're having right now. And that also links to some of the things that we've heard so far during the conference. Um, so we're basically looking at three things. A more holistic approach towards the student journey, starting before students actually arrive in Maastricht. We're thinking about more thresholds. Now, this may sound like we're making things more complicated, but at the same time, we're also talking about more intensive guidance for students to actually have a more or have a clearer student journey and one in which they're further supported throughout the three years um, and to make uh, or to help them be a successful student in our programs. Just to give you a sense of what this means, the first thing that we're talking about at the moment um, is um, how we can um, better help students before they arrive. We're talking about open days and how to better attune them to what actually happens in the programs. But we're also looking at something that we've been using for many years, but which has been um, slimmed down for a, a while, namely matching. Matching is a procedure by which students have to reflect on their study choice before they come. So they sign up, they are asked to do a small questionnaire, and that questionnaire raises questions about the program and what they can expect and to help them think about the choice they make and the conscious choice. Um, I've written about this before with a colleague uh, nearly 10 years ago. Uh, there's a QR code there which bring, brings you to an article which outlines what we've done back then. And this was at the moment that we were using it very strictly. However, the university was afraid that we would be using it too strictly, that we would get too few students. And again, as I mentioned, student numbers are very important. So we were told, and all university was told to be less strict with matching, but this is now back on the agenda. Talking about different thresholds. I already mentioned the 30 thresholds that uh, the government uh, has proposed, the minister has proposed. Um, the way in which students register for programs also offers us to do a little bit more. So we're now thinking of on top of the 30, we're looking into the opportunity and the possibility to say, well, everyone between between 30 to 45 of those 60 uh, credits will have to go to the student advisor to uh, design a mandatory study plan so that they work towards achieving the rest of the first year credit, credits um, as soon as possible. And then everyone above 45 will just be able to continue automatically. They would receive a positive advice. We're also looking at the possibility of having a threshold at the end of year two. Uh, you may remember from the slide just now that the minister has also proposed 60 credits at the end of year two. I'm not quite sure if we really want to go there, but there's some discussion on whether we shouldn't at least have this component of mandatory study plan meetings with the student advisor to help those students to 
uh, progress. And obviously this is also in the, in, the, in the interest of the faculty and the university. And a third thing that has been brought in by the program directors of the three programs is also that we shouldn't have something like a threshold before students can start their thesis. Um, this is a big discussion because there's another project going on or that's almost close to completion. And that shows that actually the reasons why students don't complete their thesis or take very long time to do so are so many faults that actually one solution does not exist. And then finally, we're talking about more intensive guidance and support. This is very much linked to the issues that were mentioned earlier on. So student transition, but also transition between the years, uh, but also supporting students in engagement, um, uh, and get, uh, making them attend classes. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, mandatory attendance, um, but there are other ways in which we can uh, encourage them to come. Things we're talking about is announcing the mentor program for all students, including a focus on induction in the induction week. Um, about these mandatory study plans, we mentioned them already. Our student advisors are already quite active and they already are able to reach quite a lot of students. Um, we want to do more consistent data gathering. Um, perhaps that is something that is already done at York, but one of the problems we've been bumping into is that there are so many different systems that don't speak to each other that getting data together to be able to help students and to also get a sense of where the real problems are has proven extremely difficult. This, for instance, concerns uh, attendance data, although here we're now working with a new virtual learning environment which offers opportunities. And then finally, a thing we're thinking about is also uh, complementary learning groups for students who have not graduated within those four years. Um, Key challenges here is that these students are already difficult to reach and already find it uh, challenging to engage with student university again. Quite a few of them are already working, even though they haven't graduated yet, doing internships or are no longer in Maastricht. So one of the questions here is then, okay, we can say that we do complementary learning groups, but how can we actually reach those students? Why don't we end up with you know, a good professor in front of a room with only two out of 20 students. Uh, and, you know, is that really something that we want to do? Um, I'm going to stop here. Um, if you want to find out more about what we do as FISOS, there's a QR code here, uh, which brings you to our website. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me at one point, there's also a QR code to my website. As I said, these are early discussions. We've only started these discussions yet. Um, we're looking into implementing some of these things within the next two to three years, uh, but I'm also very much looking forward to any questions or comments that you might have that will help us to uh, further think about how to shape that student journey uh, for our new students in Master's University. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me. Uh, I think it's uh, very nice to be back in York, even though it's online. Um, it's uh, the place where I did my PhD uh, and also the place where I had my first teaching experiences. Uh, and I have very fond memories of uh, York University or the University of York. Um, my name is Ragnar Zijs. I'm a colleague of Patrick Bijsmans, uh, assistant professor at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences uh, in Maastricht. And um, my presentation will be about a project in which students had to design what I call teaching interventions, uh, interventions that went beyond cognitive learning. Uh, as we've heard just before, thank you, Patrick, uh, Maastricht University is quite well known for its problem-based learning. Uh, and although colleagues have a wide variety of teaching formats and are experimenting quite a bit, um, I think the main format is still uh, having discussions on the basis of readings, which invokes a lot of cognitive learning. Um, however, as we uh, can see also at this very conference, also in the next presentation, I believe, um, there's increasing attention for other ways of learning, including art-based learning and census-based learning uh, going beyond the cognitive. So I'll give a very brief context of uh, the projects that I did. Uh, this was a MARBLE project and MARBLE stands for Maastricht Master Research-Based Learning Program, which is an excellence program for the third-year bachelor students uh, at the university, uh, and it lasts for four months in their final year. Uh, it's meant for students to conduct their own research uh, and includes 
active learning and also student-led learning. And a project that I, I developed was how to live in the Anthropocene. Um, and a broader context in which I formulated this project uh, was related to also art-based learning and census-based learning, as we also have a census-based learning project um, in Maastricht. And there's a link to the slide or to the to the project on this slide if you're interested. Um, I'm not going to really discuss the Anthropocene, um, but most important is to know that this refers to an era uh, which indicates uh, that humans have a very long lasting and important influence on the environment, uh, which raises new questions about how to investigate, understand, know, uh, imagine, and also teach um, the complex entanglement of uh, humans in their environments uh, and human animals relations, for example. Um, it's also a contested term, but I think that's, uh, that goes a bit too far to discuss right now. So this quote um, is in a way the starting point of this project. Uh, and the quote says, much has been written about the Anthropocene, but surprisingly little about its implications for education. The definitions uh, and interpretations of the Anthropocene are fast, but they all point towards the same formidable challenge. We need to examine who we are and what relationship we should have with the rest of the planet. The next generations will feel the full force of the Anthropocene, so there is nothing more important than preparing them for the uncertain future of the human epoch. Well, this was written uh, as a review of a book uh, about pedagogy in the Anthropocene. Um, I don't think it's entirely right anymore that there is no uh, literature on this uh, and that people are not engaging with this, but I think it's also a nice starting point for our project. Um, so literature in that sense suggests that uh, studies have indicated that uh, students, but also other young people's understandings of climate change are generally quite limited. Uh, and they suggest that there should be different didactic approaches to climate change education uh, because the current ones have been largely ineffectual in affecting students' attitudes and behavior. So very much the focus point of this literature is trying to affect students' attitudes and behavior and giving them a different kind of um, relation uh, and different types of knowledge about the uh, environment and environmental change. Uh, so this literature suggests the need for interdisciplinary, creative, participatory, and effect-driven approaches to climate change education. So we first uh, did discuss this kind of literature uh, with the students. Um, and then we uh, continued the project in which I asked them to create some teaching interventions. Um, and those interventions, students actually designed the goal of the interventions, but also the method and the target audience of the interventions. Um, and they evaluated this in relation to existing literature. And two of the um, questions that were formulated that came from the literature is how to make environmental issues and controversies more graspable, because often they are seen as quite abstract, not very concrete, maybe not directly influencing your own sort of um, living experiences. Um, and the second question was how to invoke other non-cognitive parts of learning, including the senses, bodies, emotions, uh, by means of creative methods, but also the local and the everyday uh, materials, objects, and nature itself. So to come to really a quite different way of uh, yeah, teaching. So we did two things. Um, the students actually did two things. They designed that. Uh, we first had uh, an Anthropocene cycling tour. So we cycled around Maastricht, uh, where students connected uh, broader issues of environmental change or environmental controversies to local places in Maastricht and designed a mini intervention. Um, and we cycled around Maastricht, we stopped at those different places that they selected, and we uh, did the mini interventions there. Uh, and I put three of those mini interventions as examples on the slides here. Um, I might not go through all of them, um, but one of them, the first one, um, 
was about addressing the disconnectedness of humans from nature and the environment, uh, because there's a lot of literature that suggests that people who live, for example, in cities, or they do not have a lot of uh, connections with nature unless they make a real effort to do so. Um, so this was a guided meditation in the grass on top of Mount St. Peter. Yes, we do have something that we call a mountain. Um, Multisensory, um, in the sense of listening, feeling, smelling, um, and using nature as a co-teacher. Um, we also had uh, uh, an example where uh, in the last, the, the last example on the slide, uh, where someone wanted to raise awareness about pollution issues, water pollution. Um, and what she did was to show some collected samples of the Meuse River from different places and see how the color of the water changed uh, and what it smelled like. And then to ask participants to paint a future of the river using actually partly the river water itself. Uh, in 50 years, one group was assigned this task with what, what would it look like if action is taken and B, what would it look like if action, if no action is taken? Uh, and there were some very gloomy pictures uh, for the latter, um, latter part. But it meant that people had to engage in a different way with issues of water pollution than sitting in the classroom and just reading about it and discussing that. Um, An option that I found is just Jason Dance Company, Wellstown. Will you this probably? I'm sorry. My phone is talking. Um, the second uh, part uh, was that we had two group interventions. Um, and uh, during the first intervention, participants heard an alarm and they saw the water levels rising in the room where they were sitting and they were actually asked to leave the room and the building through the window, which was simulating an experience of climate refugees, of course, in a very limited way. Um, and participants were then asked to reflect on their emotions and to process their experience in a creative format, uh, which they did through painting and writing a poem. Uh, and according to students, this intervention really helped to create an emotional link to the, to the issue, which students might not have had if they were just discussing the issue on the basis of text. So the aim also of the intervention was to foster emotional awareness and connectivity to the displacement of people and nature. Um, the second uh, example was to raise awareness. Uh, the aim was to raise awareness about waste that was generated by the fashion industry and to inspire creative solutions to this problem within people's, uh, within the realm of people's own wardrobes. Um, so participants were actually asked to bring a piece of garment which they did not use or did no longer wear. Um, and they had to reflect on why they did not wear it um, and to, um, to also discuss uh, yeah, what it costs to create such a piece of garment. So they, they gave a lot of information to the participants, uh, allowing them to kind of calculate the environmental cost of the garment they brought, which gave, which gave the participants some insight. Uh, and the second part of the workshop was also to do an upcycling activity, actually doing some embroidery or some sewing, or at least um, making sure that you would like your piece of garment again and would actually start to wear it. Have that in your wardrobe and be reminded of the waste that is there and uh, creating a sort of emotional connection in that sense. So these were some of the examples that we had. Uh, and I think these teaching interventions lead to some questions, uh, reflections um, about the role of such interventions in curricula. Um, and a first one um, has to do with student engagement. Uh, I think these, um, which is also clear from literature, such kind of interventions really have, have the potential to increase student engagement. Uh, interestingly, there were students from another course that I was coordinating uh, also on environmental change who participated in some of these workshops. And they were very enthusiastic about this kind of uh, workshops. Uh, so they, they, they really could see some potential for that also in our sort of mainstream course uh, to implement them. So in that sense, I think it could really yeah, raise uh, student engagement because it was quite uh, 
valued and it also students felt that they really felt uh, yeah interacted and uh, reported different levels of learning uh, if you can say it like that um, however we also noted that some will some students not very many but they uh, they express some discomfort either with the creative forms or with the sort of role of emotions that play a role in this uh, so the personal aspect and the emotional aspect of it um, and one can, of course, question, you know, do this work for all students? But I guess that's the same for cognitive learning, right? Um, however, our program is very much based on, on cognitive learning. Um, but the question, of course, that's raised is, this is not an art curriculum. So uh, asking students to engage in creative forms, if they're not very comfortable with that, uh, yeah, what kind of things can we ask for? there is it okay to be uncomfortable with that or should we you know, if if we would have this in our curriculum what would we do with that uh, and also when it comes to sort of the personal and the emotions that are part of it that can be invoked when you know having such a simulation uh, exercise for example um yeah how wary should we be with engaging with potentially also difficult emotions which can create an attachment to such issues but of course, uh, we are also in an era where uh, there's a lot of, uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of emotions already in terms of, for example, decolonizing curricula, uh, but also climate anxiety. Um, so how to, how to deal with that? Um, and the third question is then how to balance cognitive, experiential, embodied sensory and art-based learning in the teaching of various subjects, because we also found that the cognitive part was still a very important part of the interventions. Um, the second, second, uh, second question can be related to assessment. So how to assess these forms of learning and knowing. Um, you know, upcycling and sewing skills are not part of our curriculum. Um, so how to evaluate and should we evaluate like creative outcomes? Um, if emotional attachment is a goal at all, how do you measure that? Um, and that, that then questions the role in our curricula. I can see them as small, you know, teasers, small parts or voluntary activities, but can they also be kind of core components? And what is the aim of those core components? Um, and in terms of assessment, there might also be some uncertainty or some unexpected learning outcomes. If, for example, you use uh, the method of nature as a co-teacher, then um, how then do you... Uh, use that in your learning outcomes? Uh, and how do you create an exam on the basis of that uh, if you don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be? Um, there are, of course, some organizational issues as well. We are very used to teach in the classroom um, and doing yeah, an Anthropocene um, cycling tour as we did. Um, goes goes outside of those boundaries of our normal organizational practices. Um, and maybe a last issue that I'm still kind of uh, discussing with myself. <laughs> um, uh, there is a lot of literature about the value of multisensory and experiential learning. Uh, often individuals are more engaged in learning and process the information also more easily, which makes the learning more effective. There's quite a lot of literature on that. Um, however, there is also some, yeah, there can also be some kind of normative questions in terms of uh, when we are used to and expect to do more cognitive learning, what then is the role of art-based learning, for example? Uh, what if we have specific aims with our interventions, such as in this case, uh, to create maybe some other engagements with the environment um, in maybe places where also uh, climate change is contested, uh, how to deal with these kind of normativities? Um, so I think there's there's... Uh, we know that the education in general is not value neutral. We also make choice. We always make choices about what we teach and how we teach that. Um, but I think at the moment that this also invokes different emotions or um, or make a conscious choice to to uh, deal with that, uh, maybe we should think about the normativities that are implied in this. Uh, it's not to say that normative like cognitive learning does not imply any emotions. We can see that from a lot of debates right uh, right now, uh, for example, on the decolonization of curricula. Uh, there's a lot of emotions involved, 
but somehow we have some sort of the impression that with cognitive learning, they're not so much there. But I think what, what if you put them center stage and not backstage, uh, what happens then? Uh, so these are some questions that I'm, uh, well, I'm still interested in. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to hear your thoughts or questions on this. Thank you. There are some references on the last slide here. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Stama Tulapanagaku, and uh, I take part in this uh, conference from Athens, Greece. It's actually at about two afternoon now. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to this wonderful and very useful conference, which I have attended many times in the past, especially before the pandemic. During the pandemic, there was a kind of break, and now we are back. And the most important thing for me is that uh, I am back as a presenter, not just attending the conference. Um, just for the history of things to say that I did my master's degree and my PhD at the University of York. I worked at the University of York in politics department many years and also at Durham University, Newcastle, Manchester. And now uh, I am based at the University of Cyprus in Cyprus. Uh, I teach courses in political science, political theory and social theory, history of political thought, intellectual history, feminism, gender power and politics, political ideologies, and many other courses in the broader spectrum of humanities and social sciences. I forgot to, to uh, restate the title of my presentation, which is Art and the Teaching of Politics, and not only in politics. I personally believe in the power of art, in all its forms and manifestations, to make our life better, more interesting, and more informed. I also believe in the self-transformative aspect of art, in the knowledge and awareness it brings to us, in the new paths to understanding and explorations it opens for us. The German Jewish philosopher Herbert Marcuse once said in his book, The Aesthetic Dimension, I do not quote, just I, I transfer to you the, the, the gist of his uh, words. Uh, art cannot change the world, but uh, it can change, it can affect the consciousness of men and women who will change the world. Because the work of art, a painting, a film, a piece of music, a poem, a play, has a direct impact on the mind and consciousness of yours and the students in this particular case, I thought it important to use art and the aesthetic experience as an educational tool in my learning and teaching activities at the university. Actually, I liked very much Dr. Chai's uh, Rania, <laughs> uh, use of word uh, nature as a co-teacher. So I can say art as a co-teacher, imitating your very useful uh, phrase. But my decision to utilize art in my teaching was also based on my philosophical background as a British idealist scholar, researching the philosophy of Bernard Bosanquet, Edward Kerr, Lord Haldane, uh, Robin George Collingwood, and others, I discovered that for them, art and the aesthetic do have a connection to the social and the political as an ingredient in the self-development process and in the connection of the individual with the social whole. The aesthetic consciousness broadens the horizon of perception and understanding and opens paths to exploration and spiritual evolution. Poetry brings us closer to the truth, according to Edward Kerr. The poet and the philosopher are seekers of a truth that lies deeper than the truth of the particular, which is the object of scientific analysis. Poetry grasps the developing spirit of humanity uh, and becomes a medium for the expression of eternal truths. For Bosanquet, art relates to the human desire for expression and has a pedagogical role, either as high art or as craft. The key point here is the development of individual capacity through creativity, expressiveness, 
perception, failing, imagination, understanding of principles. Participation in the arts and crafts workshop enables the youth to get involved in the artistic creation, to develop their sensitivity and grasp principles and values. These are the things that the British idealist philosopher Ben Bosnick believes. For Collingwood, the relation between artists and their audience is important. It signifies a process that involves search for truth, self-knowledge, emotion, recreation of emotion, and stimulation of the creative capacities. If you want more on British idealists, just email me and I will be there for you. When I introduced elements of arts to my teaching, I saw <coughs> sorry, that my students had a more intense in enjoyment and reception of the learning experience. They became more autonomous and independent in their own research, and they looked for more information about the topics we discussed while they were thinking for themselves in multiple creative and innovative ways. We discussed difficult and complex topics. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Such as women in Islamic politics, violence and politics, the Cyprus problem, conflict resolution, tradition and modernization, British politics, revolution and liberation, Princess Diana and the media, women's empowerment and rights, medieval art politics, leadership and mirrors for princes. Art gave them a stimulus to think outside the box, to illuminate the issues, not only with scholarly information, but also with their own reactions and interpretations and the critical assessment of the works about. Reflecting on a topic through a work of art, a film, a novel, a poem, made the thinking process more relaxing, the discussion more lively and fun, and the flow of ideas more natural for all of us, not only for students. The dialogue was a pleasure to watch, and it became a learning experience for me too, as I witnessed the students' thinking processes and their interaction unimpeded from the fetters of rigid scholarship to hit the key points and accomplish the purpose of our meetings. I use mostly film screenings as it is easier during the lectures, movies and documentaries. And I have done educational visits to the museums. I used activities in the teaching of both postgraduate and undergraduate level, and also in the classes which involve Erasmus students. Although I'm in politics department, when I do these activities, I have groups of students who come with their tutors from other departments. So we do some interdepartmental and interdisciplinary connections. It is extremely interesting to see students from different departments to engage in a dialogue concerning, for instance, the Antigone, the Greek drama by Sophocles, or the Brick Lane, the novel by Monica Ali, which became a film as well. All the students from different disciplines bring to our attention different perspectives. And the discussion is fruitful and stimulating for all the participants. The students develop skills and build capacities. They learn to listen to others, uh, to learn, to learn things that they didn't know and to explain their views and ideas to other peers who do not come from the same discipline. The variety of countries brings variety to the educational experience and sharing insights and knowledge. The films I show give ideas for further research or for MA research, for dissertations, or for broadening the horizons of one's knowledge. Uh, what starts as a play or a relaxing activity takes a more serious form as the choice of further studies is inspired by the screening of a film. And here we have Aristotle who says in the um, 
politics in the last book, I think, that I mean the, the most important, the most essential and the most useful form of learning is play and the leisure activities. There you learn a lot. What I like very much is the fact that students, when they see a film with me, or when we go to a museum uh, to do an educational activity, the next day they brought their parents as well in order to, to, to show them what they learn. So it's a kind of community outreach activity as well. Let's see some of the films I showed. The film Elizabeth, and I'm referring here to my experience in, uh, in at the University of Cyprus, not in a British university. Uh, so many things which are for a British audience, uh, um, sort of fact, they know. Uh, people from other countries, they don't know. They have heard, but they have never studied. The film Elizabeth offered us ideas about the politics of the Tudor era, the reign of Elizabeth I the conflict between Catholicism and Protestantism and its implications for the English political life, as well as a unique paradigm of female leadership. This was a film that greatly facilitated the learning and teaching process in the Department of Politics as it presented in a stunning audiovisual way difficult concepts and not very familiar historical situations for a non-British audience. The Queen, with Helen Mirren stimulated interest in the premiership of Tony Blair, the royal family, the charity work of Princess Diana, the role of the media, social psychology, leadership, the status and the duties of monarchy, as well as issues of tradition and modernization. And here we discuss the sociological theory of Adam and Giddens, which helped us to understand issues of tradition and modernization. Uh, we saw how a political system deals successfully with a near constitutional crisis, and we examined the role of memoirs of the principal actors, Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell, in this episode of contemporary British history. Students from politics, sociology, history, and other departments benefited because they explored issues that they have probably heard of but they had never seen them in a structured and interesting way. The students explored the role of celebrity and icons in political life. Something important here, students from the journalism department, the journal school, who also attended the event, um, made useful connections with other emblematic figures. For instance, the ex-prime uh, minister of Greece, Andreas Papandreou, J.F. Kennedy, and Marilyn Monroe and their media celebrity status, the use and abuse of their life in the media and their place in the popular imagination. So you see that uh, uh, something which was a British story uh, was appropriated in many different ways and the people were stimulated to think and to use their own experience from their own countries. In this event, I'd like to mention, we had the honor to host as a guest, the famous film director, Costa Gavras, who talked to the students on politics, films, the media, and the importance of art for self-empowerment, freedom, and a holistic human development. What is important here, apart from the great honor to have Costa Gavras in the classroom, in the auditorium, is that uh, it was a period of time that Cyprus was, you know, faced all this difficult uh, uh, financial situation with memorandum and all these kind of things in Greece as well. So Costa Gavras gave them a, a vision that, that told them that education, uh, art, the enjoyment of art is, is something that nobody can take from you and something that you have to use in order to strengthen yourself, in order to support yourself, in order to help your country to recover from all this nasty situation. Uh, yes, the film, uh, films about the life and work of Benazir Bhutto, Muslim immigrants in the UK with particular emphasis upon women and their empowerment, Rick Lake, my Monica Ali, a documentary about the rise and fall of Margaret Thatcher and the episode of the Falklands, and the film about the German Bader Michael complex offered important food for thought about the relevant issues, which, if you like, we can discuss 
uh, further. And also, I would like to say that uh, I gave an um, experiential workshop to migrant women in Greece um, some, some years ago, and uh, we discussed the poetry of uh, Odyssey Aselitis, and it was a workshop of empowerment, of uh, joy, of creativity, and of independent thought and freedom for women who had uh, didn't have these values and these uh, opportunities and these uh, opportunities to, to develop in that way in their own countries. And thank you so much for attending my talk. Uh, thank you so much for uh, hosting me in this wonderful conference. All right, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, all right, we'd like to open up to any questions for any of the three presentations that we've had today. So if anybody joining us online would like to ask a question, um, please do pop this in the Q&A. Um, and we've uh, got everybody that we can see them up there now. Um, so please do pop a question in the Q&A box. Um, on the webinar. And do we have any questions in person? Ooh, we've got one over here. So we'll kick off with an in-person question. Thanks. I'd like, I'd like to say thank you to all three speakers. I got quite a lot out of those. And um, I've got questions for all of you, actually, if I'm be permitted. Um, uh, we might as well start with Patrick, if that's all right. Um, yeah what you were describing we call academic progression in York um, and we have threshold criteria for that as well I guess what was provoked in my mind is whether academic progression should be the sole criterion for allowing students to be at university I'd be interested in your thoughts on that one should we, should we, should we kick off with that I'll see if I'm permitted a second one <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Um, I personally do not think that should not that should be the only uh, thing that we need to consider. Uh, I think the discussions that we're having now are very much about what is going to happen if we are forced to lower thresholds for uh, binding study advice. Um, we are actually also considering having looser thresholds in a sense, for instance, that we only keep it to mandatory talks with student advisors and also looking at other kinds of things. But the discussion has very much started from indeed this idea amongst universities, and this is the case at every university in the Netherlands, that this, this idea of a binding study advice is the key component of trying to steer students in their academic progression. Again, I personally do not necessarily believe in this. Um, I already mentioned we have very active student advisors uh, they are very well appreciated by uh, students, but also by colleagues for actively reaching out for students, for actively sitting down with students to help them. Um, and that, in my view, seems to be much more efficient and students very much welcome these things much more than someone telling them that you need to meet X credits to be able to move on with your studies. Um, I think the other thing is, all these thresholds to me are also relatively crude. Uh, I just mentioned this 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 um, COVID experiment that we all of a sudden got, which shows that quite a lot of the students, or at least some of the data that we have so far, but we need more data on this. But it suggests that quite a lot of students that would normally not meet the threshold and would be sent away are actually able to catch up because they just need a little bit more time to get used to university. Uh, uh, and, and that to me was really an eye opener. Uh, the only challenge at the moment is that there's some other data that now questions that data. So we really, really need to dive into this. But I fully agree. I, I, I don't think this is the only thing. I do think we need to look at this more, much more holistically. Uh, and this is very much the start of our discussions. But thank you very much for that question. All right. Thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, Stamatula, I can see you've got your hand up there. Would you like to say something? You're on mute. Stamatula, you're on mute. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know the way that we put the questions because I have a question for uh, just an observation for Rania and one for Patrick. Do we say this now or we take one paper and uh, how how we proceed with questions? It's for Patrick. The question for Patrick now. Okay. Um, as far as your as as far as your paper is concerned, um, I found it very interesting, and also I find very interesting the idea of um, the, the human factor here, the human touch. I mean, in this kind of of a tutoring and offering support uh, to students in order to to continue and in order to progress in their own studies. Um, I think it it is very important to have people to to have. Uh, the teachers to have the appropriate training as well, and to have people who can do this kind of work. I remember when I was in Europe, when I was in England, we had many workshops when we started as teaching assistants, what to do, what not to do, and that sort of thing. It was very, very important. And what I found very important is there are some things that uh, naively you want to engage a student comes with a, a particular problem and uh, the advice of the experts was that in these cases it's better to refer to the student to someone who is more expert in this because your intervention might not be so good as you think uh, so it, it's i think it's a it's a it's a whole art and science this tutoring supporting advising students another issue i would like to say here is that all of this we do we are here because we believe in the pedagogy in the academia but do academia does academia uh, give us credit for this because my experience is that if you do teaching if you care for teaching if you care for this for the whole art and science of teaching and what you're not an educationalist then you are damned or something like that i mean so we have to we have to change also the system because the system is very good on paper but when you actually start doing things i mean i have heard colleagues who say oh you care about them and you, you spend time on museums and this you know and for me it's important because um, I deal with, with human souls and I give them the gift of communication and the gift of de developing themselves and also I take from them and this is a benefit for us too. So that's an observation. I mean, we have to value, as Lord Fordane says, we as a society and as a politics, a political system, we have to value the educators and acknowledge the work they do at all levels of the educational system. Lord Haldane, a very important British philosopher and politician. Right. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time because um, I think we've, we've had a, a lot that we've been discussing this morning. Um, but are there any other questions that we'd like to ask? I know that you definitely have another one. Is there anybody else that would like to ask anything before I hand the microphone back to this gentleman? Okay. All right, over to you. Yes, thanks. I'd, I'd like to ask both Stamatula and Ragnar. You, you're both asking students to engage with the subject in ways they probably didn't expect to have to engage. Um, and, and I was wondering if there were it was necessary and if so how to prepare students for the, the the sort of different types of activity that you're asking them to engage with which which they may not expect or they may not have the tools to deal with i wonder if i could hear from both of you about that please Rania, would you like to <laughs> sure um i think that's a very good question um so thanks for that um in in the project that I just presented, this was an excellent project um, of which I submitted a, a, a description of the project and the students who were selected for the for the uh, excellence program, they could select on the basis of this description of the project. So they had some idea of what they were <laughs> what they were in for. This was also not the only aspect of the project. So we also they also had to write a review paper. Um, 
learning the skills of writing with your paper. Uh, but part of it was to do this kind of teaching intervention indeed. Um, and it was actually within the project that we prepared them for that. So it was by, by engaging with this literature, trying to figure out so if we take seriously some of this literature on what the Anthropocene is and the kinds of challenges that may uh, that that we might actually be facing right now, but that might you know, increase in the future, is uh, the question is then is our education sufficient or is that the right way of um, education in that? Um, and then there is a lot of literature suggesting and uh, making suggestions for other types of learning um, to in a way be better prepared, whatever that may mean, uh, for uh, for this uncertain future that we might be facing and to build up different, different types of relationships with the environment, trying to build more caring relationships maybe. Um, well, there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, so by I think by reading that literature, students got a pretty good idea of what was out there in, in the literature. And then the idea was to indeed, uh, what kind of, we, we also look in the literature for what kind of interventions are there, what kind of ways are there in which people uh, discuss this. So we, we discussed uh, literature that discussed uh, the role of objects in uh, teaching environmental issues, for example. Uh, so these were also some sort of alternatives. Um, but then the challenge was to, for themselves also to think out of the box and, you know, what if we, uh, you, you address an issue that is, uh, that you find important, uh, how, how are you going to tackle that? What is going to be your method? How can you, uh, and, uh, and the goal needs to, uh, to fit the method and things like that. And that was already, you know, a challenge. Um, but I think we, yeah, we prepared them basically by looking through the literature and talking through the different steps and the kinds of choices that they made in terms of, okay, what is your goal? And then does this method actually, you know, achieve that goal or does that, uh, does it not do that? Um, so there was not, yeah, no, no well, very specific uh, guidance in other than kind of pretty normal standard academic guidance, I would say, uh, for how to design a project. Right. Thank you very much, Ragna. Um, Stamatula, did you want to respond to that as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think in my case is uh, easier than uh, Rania's case because it is a film, it's a, a visit to the museum. It was part, it wasn't a different project. I mean, the, when, I, we, when we visit the museum or when we see a film or a documentary, it is not something, uh, it's not something that belongs to a project, it's part of, of the course. So when I teach, for instance, um, a feminist political theory, we saw the documentary about Benazir Bhutto. Uh, gender politics and power, we saw the Brick Lane. Um, theories of natural rights, we saw Adigoni by Sophocles, the ancient Greek drama. Uh, of course, there is, there is lots of preparation in order to be so effortless, as they say in classical ballet, there is a lot of preparation because you, you have to present things to people who are not uh, necessarily aware of of uh, of these things. For instance, when we saw the the film uh, The Queen, uh, I had to do lots of research reading the um, diaries of Alistair Campbell, of uh, of of, the, of the, the press of the day, of what happened. I knew this, but I mean, I had to present it in a way which is interesting, useful, and uh, effective for a non-British audience and to be able to draw uh, the reaction and to make it useful for them and to make the necessary connections. Also, sometimes I have um, speakers which uh, refer, which uh, take an aspect of the movie and uh, refer, discuss this aspect. So there is lots of preparation, but in a way which is like community outreach. So they can bring uh, in the class the, the friends from other departments, the parents, why not, when it's an event. So it is lots of preparation in order to become effective, efficient, and effortless, and to, 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 to show effortless. <laughs> all right. Um, I'd like to uh, thank all three of you for um, speaking today. It's been fantastic listening to you. 
and uh, thank you for the, the questions from the audience as well. Um, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for at the moment. We're going to need to move on to the next lot of presentations. Um, but Patrick, Ragnar, Stamatula, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's great to have some, some people who can come and join us from other places. And I know colleagues are always very interested to meet people from other places and hear about their experiences and their work as well. So thank you very much. Um, we can exchange emails as well because it's very useful to stay in touch. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it definitely is. And that's one of the great things about the conference is being able to meet other people and network and learn from one another and see if there's opportunities to collaborate. And so hopefully uh, you'll get some, some more uh, questions and things from people when they go away and digest what we've been talking about today as well. Um, and uh, if you want us to share anything, um, then you can send that over to us on the Learning and Teaching Forum email, and we can add that onto the website and things as well. So, all right. Well, thank you so much, the three of you. Um, and thank you to those of us joining online as well. We're just going to get sorted out to set up for the next round of presentations. So we'll just be a couple of minutes and then we'll kick off there. Um, so thank you very much.